we're going to get started if you want to get seated and ready to go. Um, thank you very much for coming tonight for this second uh, cannabis, Santa Cruz County Cannabis Licensing uh, Workshop. Uh, it's a really kind of a important time right now. We're, we're really gearing up for moving forward with licensing in the new year. Um, and our environmental impact report is out. Uh, the state is getting closer and closer to finalizing its regulations for all of the pieces that come into play for the state license that you'll need to get in addition to your local license. So we thought it was kind of a, maybe a crucial time for you to kind of see the faces behind the state requirements uh, that will be, um, uh, you know, these are the folks that will be involved with your future permitting. So tonight is a state-oriented workshop where we are, um, you know, just to be clear, we're not talking about the local license and what you need for a local license. Tonight is all about the state licensing. And uh, we have, uh, let's see, four different agencies here from the state of California. We have CAL FIRE. We have the State Water Board, the Regional Water Quality Control Board, and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So all of these agencies will talk to you and kind of walk you through the why, what, when, the timelines if they know them, and all of that. So that's kind of what we're going to go through today. But before we start on that, I just wanted to take a couple minutes uh, about Santa Cruz County oriented items, uh, just to give you a brief update in case you didn't already know about it. First of all, we have a new licensing. I should have introduced myself first, I guess. Uh, my name is Loretta Moreno, and I'm the resource planner for the um, Cannabis Licensing Office here. And uh, we also now have a new addition uh, coming to you from the planning department of Santa Cruz County. And uh, she's our new licensing manager, a great asset to us. We're really excited about her. This is Robin Bolster Grant. She's just going to say a few words real quick. Ah, yes, <laughs> words. Uh, Thank you again uh, for coming out. Um, I, as Loretta said, I've been uh, a planner here in Santa Cruz County for 16 years, uh, most recently in code compliance. Um, I, my philosophy about um, this whole grand experiment is that we are going to be educating each other. Um, I am uh, very familiar with uh, the notion of balancing interests. Um, protecting the environment, preserving neighborhoods, and of course economic development, um, and taking care of patients and, and soon to be uh, consumers broadly. Um, I am available, uh, I'm learning, I'm, I've only been in, with the licensing office for about three weeks, so I'm all sleep deprived. Um, it's a steep learning curve, but, um, but I'm really open. I see this as a partnership I think we all want the same thing. We want this program to succeed. We want to um, preserve the values that are important to our entire community. Um, and, uh, and we can do this uh, together. Uh, I know a lot about uh, permits broadly, and, and I will help navigate through what can be a very confusing uh, system, for sure. And that's, uh, that's what I've been doing for, for most of my career here. So um, I have cards in the back. Um, don't hesitate to call or drop by. And, uh, and I'll, I'll let you know what I know. Thanks again. Yeah, and so just next, another brief, uh, just a real quick plug on the environmental impact report that is out. Uh, Matt Johnston from the planning department just wants to let you know about the timeline. So looking at commercial cannabis cultivation and manufacturing, our environmental impact report is out. And Matt just wants to say just a couple words. Sorry. Thank you, Brett. Um, Matt Johnston, I also, like Robin, has been here for about 17 years as a planner. I've been working on the EIR for the last year, and it is out for comment. Um, the comment period ends October 16th. Uh, we will be having a public meeting to accept comments here on October 2nd at 6.30, uh, 6.30 to 8.30 in the evening. And um, I also want to say I'm, you know, Following Robin's footsteps, I'm moving on from as a resource planner to taking over the code enforcement side. We do recognize to have for this industry to be successful, there has to be robust code enforcement as well. And so I'll be working closely with Robin on that side of the issue. Um, but please, everyone, in, for, in order for this program to work, in order for the EIR to be a um, viable and valuable piece of uh, document, and for the board to make the best decisions, they need your input. So please take the time to read the document, make comments on the document that speak to not just what your opinion is, 
but the analysis. Look at the analysis, look and see if there's anything we missed. Um, look and see if there are other mitigations that might help to make, to reduce the impacts from the industry. Uh, and, and definitely include your opinions as well, because all of this will be part of the process for the board to make their final determination. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. And just to tag on a little bit more there, the uh, October 2nd date where you can kind of physically come in and, and give your comments in public and um, everything, yeah, that is that date, but anytime you can submit your comments. So anytime until the 16th, you can submit it by email or by mail, just to be clear. So, um, oh, oh, the website. What would be the Santa Cruz so, County planning? Yeah, in, in terms of the easiest way to comment is to go to the Santa Cruz County website um, to, or to see the EIR. At the Santa Cruz County website, to the planning department, there's a link there. Um, emails can be is our uh, cannabis EIR at santacruzcounty.com. Um, I believe www.santacruzcounty.backslash uh, cannabis EIR is the, the website. And uh, there's libraries with the, the EIR if you want to hold it in your hands. And, you know, it's really big. So here it is, just visual. Um, yeah, so that's that. And um, and then I just wanted to point out that this meeting is going to be, is being filmed so that you can watch it back later if you just, things came by too quickly and you didn't catch it, don't worry, you can watch it later. Um, that's kind of the plan there. And um, also there's a little bit of food in the back. We put out some cookies and treats, so feel free to grab that at any time. And there is a table outside with some uh, flyers and info for you that people put out, uh, the agencies. So without any more delay, I'd like to introduce to you um, our speakers up first. We're gonna have them give a, a talk and then afterwards they're gonna have a few minutes for questions. After each talk, there'll be a few minutes for questions, and at the end, we'll just have kind of an open question answer, you know, any kind of general questions about the regulations. So our first speakers come to us from the State Water Resources Control Board, and, uh, wait, the State Water Quality Control Board, excuse me. State Water Resources. Oh, excuse me, I did say it right the first time, yeah, I'm mixing everything. And then the Central Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board. So we have um, Leah Lemoyne. We have James Bishop, and then also speaking will be uh, Dan Schultz, and he's from the State Board. So they're going to take over. I do think you guys should um, talk me behind here because it doesn't pick up really well. Okay, thank you. So once again, my name is Dan Schultz, and um, I'm going to cover uh, the draft cannabis policy and the general order. Um, so I'm going to focus on the policy and attachment A to the policy, which has most of the requirements and the staff report, and then I'll turn it over to James and Leah to talk a little bit about the general order. Okay, so these documents, um, the public comment period just ended uh, September 6th. They're still draft, um, and we're, we're re reviewing the comments right now and responding to those comments is kind of where we are at this point. So a little um, outline of what we're going to talk to talk about tonight. First, I'll go over a little legislative background and background of, of how we got here. Um, then I'll cover some of the water board's responsibilities, an overview of the draft policy and attachment A, and then the small irrigation use registration, and then we'll have an overview of the draft cannabis general order. So legislative background, in 2015, three bills were adopted, the Assembly Bill 243, 266, and Senate Bill 643, and that created the Medical Marijuana Regulation and Safety Act. Oh, I got that right, yes. And uh, then in, in June of 2016, Senate Bill 8, 837 was adopted, and this basically included cleanup language and combined those three bills into one bill. And that created, changed the main thing it did, one of the main things it did was change marijuana to cannabis, so moving forward was all cannabis, and that was the Medical Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act. Of course, in November of 2016, um, the Adult Use Medical or Adult Use Marijuana Act passed, and then in June of 2017, just this last June, uh, Senate Bill 94 was adopted, which basically combined Macursa and Awuma and established the Medicinal and Adult Use Cannabis Regulations and Safety Act. So that's kind of the background of the legislative background. So within um, the, the, the that legislative components. Um, there were specific state water board responsibilities. And so one of those is that state water board or appropriate regional water boards was to establish 
a um, general order to address discharges of waste from cannabis cultivation. And another one was that the State Water Board was to ensure the individual and cumulative effects of uh, water diversion and discharge of waste related to cannabis cultivation do not affect in-stream flows and flows needed for fish spawning, migration, rearing, and to maintain the natural flow variability. It also went on to include direction for the State Water Board to develop a policy for water quality control that would establish the principles and guidelines, which are basically requirements uh, for cannabis cultivation. And these include, should include measures to protect springs, wetlands, and aquatic habitat from negative impacts of cannabis cultivation, and may include requirements for groundwater uh, extractions. And basically, <clears throat> at the state level, policy is, is pretty much functions the same as a regulation. So that's kind of what, what that is. So our timeline is, um, as I mentioned, the draft staff report and policy and general order were released for public comment. Uh, we held a few workshops uh, around, mainly up in Eureka and then at the State Water Board. And then um, public comment period closed, and we're planning on, this is the key one, we're planning on bringing the final documents to the, to the board for adoption, which would be in Sacramento on October 17, 2017. We're working on a really tight deadline on this, on this project. Um, the goal is to have the requirements out um, or the policy adopted and approved by the Office of Administrative Law prior to January of 2018. And we'll get into that reason in just a minute. Um, but right now we're looking, if the board were to adopt it on October 17th, the policy would become effective assuming the OAL, Office of Administrative Law, approved that um, in late November, early December. So the draft Cannabis policy and general order, we'll, I'll cover a little bit in more detail about the different types of things in these. Um, basically, the policy describes the overall structure of the board's proposed cannabis cultivation regulatory program, and it also includes in attachment A, the water quality and stream flow requirements. The staff report provides the background information and rationale for the requirements in the policy, and then the general order includes the tier structure, fee structure, and environmental management plans. So the way this program basically works is the policy and the requirements are kind of the overarching document. The policy, then the requirements in the policy get, um, get put into the general order. So they're the general order, which we'll talk about in a bit, and then the small irrigation use registration program. And they also become components of the, um, Cal, the California Department of Food and Ag's Cal Cannabis Cultivation License. So those are pretty much the three areas that these requirements go into. So the cannabis cultivation policy, um, basically we're going to focus mainly on attachment A, that's kind of where all the nuts and bolts are, and I'll go into, there's basically six sections in that attachment, there's, it includes um, general requirements and prohibitions, it includes water diversion and waste discharge requirements, numeric and narrative flow requirements, watershed compliance gauge assignments, uh, the planning and reporting, which is a component of the general order, and then also some useful guidance documents, some links to useful guidance documents. So the main document of the policy um, provides kind of the overview of the Water Board's program and context for how it fits in with other cannabis, cannabis regulatory programs. Um, it establishes 14 regions throughout the state for in-stream flow requirements, and it, it, it discusses the continuing authority to amend the policy and how the policy will be enforced. So one important thing that was in the legislation was that the State Water Board was to develop interim and long-term requirements. So right now we're looking at the interim requirements, and these are, uh, they apply statewide. Over time, we, we envision that we'll probably bring this policy back to the board for the next three years or so, like every year for the next three years, to kind of refine what we went out there with. Um, cannabis cultivation, we don't have a ton of information on it. Most of what we have right now is from inspections or enforcement. Um, so we kind of see that side of, of the picture of what some of the impacts are, but we also don't know, you know, once we crafted these, these requirements, there's going to be some that need to be adjusted. Maybe some are too limiting. Maybe some aren't restrictive enough. Um, flow re requirements might, might, might need some adjusting and, um, and other things like that. And one of the big things that we'll start to get more information on is, is actual water use crop demand. Um, there's a lot of different numbers that are floating out and around right now. So we're, we're looking to, once we start to get that information, that information start, starts to get collected, we'll start to look at that and, and see what needs to be revised. And then the, um, as we move forward, we're going to look at more along with the uh, regional uh, boundaries that we set up. 
we're going to start to focus in on different regions and take a closer look at each of those regions and tailor more long-term flow requirements in particular to those regions. <coughs> so those are the 14 regions. We're in region, I think it's three, nine. no, nine, sorry, thank you. <laughs> so um, the policy requirements. So we'll start off with some of the in-stream flow requirements. Um, basically, the, the, and this is just a quick overview, um, similar to the EIR, the policy documents over here, and it's pretty thick. Um, there's quite a few requirements in there, uh, but we'll just kind of highlight the bigger ones. Right now, there is a surface water forbearance uh, period. Forbearance means you cannot divert water from surface water during between April 1st and October 31st of each year. Um, there's also, during the diversion season, there's a 10 gallon minimum, min, per minute maximum diversion rate and 50% of the flow should be bypassed. There's also the numeric in-stream flow engaging requirements. And basically this was, uh, um, we had some unimpaired flow information from, that was modeled from a USGS and, and our United States Geologic Survey and Nature Conservancy effort. And that allows us to basically apply what was called a testament method, which is a percent of unimpaired flow. And that's how we establish the, um, the flow requirements and the policy. And we established those at compliance gauges. So we looked at all the existing gauges from the, United, from the USGS and the um, Department of Water Resources on their, on their websites. And we established the flow requirement at those gauges, and those become the compliance gauges. So when cultivators need, or during the diversion season prior to diverting, the cultivator will need to check and make sure that the flow requirements being met at that gauge prior to diverting. The minimum flows. Yes, minimum flows to sustain fish in aquatic habitat is what those are, are to be protected of. Um, the other component is that the bird shall measure and record uh, daily water diversion and use, and gauge installation requirements. Um, so with the gauge installation, obviously we took a look at the gauges that were easy for us to kind of do to take to determine whether or not they're what the data they were collecting was adequate, what their operation and maintenance schedule was to make sure that it was a gauge that we knew we could use. We recognize there's a lot more gauges than that out there. Um, so there's flexibility within the policy for um, cannabis cultivators or uh, nonprofits or other stakeholders to point out a gauge and recommend we use that gauge to represent an area instead of the, the gauge that we're currently using. Um, this basically, with our set of gauges, there'll be areas that don't have a gauge or watersheds that don't have a gauge at all, reporting to another watershed that does have a gauge. So it's not a perfect system. And we look to, to kind of modify that over time as we go. So there's three main things with the compliance gauge installation. One is um, requesting that we use a different gauge to report to. The second is that if we, the state water board identifies areas where there's significant cannabis cultivation, and surface water um, diversion, we may require the cultivators to install a local gauge there and move the flow requirement to that gauge. And then also, if cannabis cultivators think that you know demand over in this watershed is much higher than what we're using for than what we have in our watershed, they can um, request to put in their own gauge as well, and we can move the flow requirement to that gauge. So groundwater and springs. Um, so there are some provisions in the policy related to groundwater. Um, basically what's in there is during the forbearance period, we created, uh, we developed some in-stream low flow thresholds, and that will probably turn to a different term like aquatic base flow. But basically, these, these flows are, are established to kind of identify the minimum flows that need to be in, stream, in the stream just for general aquatic health. And so what we're using this for is that if we see locations where that flow is not being met and we see a significant number of groundwater diversions in the localized area, we may develop um, groundwater requirements in the future, such as a, uh, you know, some sort of forbearance period or other requirements. And this would be a process where we would notify those groundwater diverters prior to initiating it. So if it was, let's just say next summer, we see this impact, we would notify those cultivators that next summer, you know, where they're going to need to come up with alternative measures, perhaps some storage and diverting during a different time of year for, from the groundwater. Um, and then the other, the other components with the groundwater is the other things we're kind of looking at is just in general, you know, areas that have significant groundwater diversions that are with a lot of cannabis cultivation. And also, um, if we see a significant amount of surface water diverters switching to groundwater, 
typically that means that the wells are, are usually closer in proximity to the stream systems, which means that there's usually a higher impact, so that would be another component that we'd be looking at. For the springs, are, they're kind of a tricky element in water rights. Um, the fully contained springs do not need to report their water, their water use and diversion to the water board. Uh, they're treated similar to groundwater. And a fully contained spring is defined as a spring that does not run off the property and does not have surface or subsurface hydrologic connectivity at any time of the year during all water year types to, to a surface water body. Um, so for these in particular, um, the forbearance period at this time is, is still applying to these springs. However, the 50% bypass requirement does not apply. These are typically smaller stream, smaller springs that are producing a lot of water. So um, their, their, their contribution to the um, surface water is not as significant as larger springs. And they'll still need to look at the um, minimum flow and compliance gauge for, for diversions as well. So I, I think I had the slide in there. So <laughs> this is going back to the gauge assignments. Um, we pretty much already discussed this. I don't think there's anything extra in this slide. No. So some other key requirements, these are kind of more of our general water quality requirements and they also um, have some water diversion and storage requirements. Um, but <clears throat> The first one is, is a requirement that we're, we're working on. We are, um, the policy does allow cultivation up to 50% slopes under the general order. Um, for these in particular, the 30 50% slopes, uh, they become a little bit more of an issue from a from control and erosion and impact standpoint. So for new cultivation sites that haven't, that haven't been established yet, they're going to need to enter in, apply to the general order, but submit their, um, their I don't think I have to name it up there, I'm not, I'm not going to remember. Well, there's a plan that I can't remember. Erosion and sediment control. Thank you, the erosion and sediment control plan uh, prior to doing any, any grading or earthwork or site establishment. Um, and that's just to make sure that that site is suitable for, for establishing a cultivation site. Um, and then that also applies to, to existing sites that are, that are doing you know, an extensive expansion or something of that nature. They just need to work with the regional board, local regional board, prior to moving forward to make sure that their erosion control measures are going to control the, any erosion or anything else that may any, any impacts from that site. Uh, so during that, the regional board may require additional measures um, for the cultivator to do to make sure that that site is uh, stable. Or if it's, if it's just a site that's not going to work, they have the option to, um, to not allow the cultivation to go there. Um, there are riparian setbacks as well. Um, they're between 50 and 200 feet of policy. This is something that uh, you'll see another slide later that shows, shows us in a little bit more detail. Um, this is something that we've heard a lot from, from commenters about the, the actual setback distances, and we're evaluating that right now as part of our response to comments and updates to the draft to final policy. Um, there's also general erosion control measures for the entire cultivation site. Um, it covers stream crossings, installation, <coughs> and uh, culverts and road development. This is part of the um, general water quality certification component. So prior to doing any work in the streams, of course, you still need to go through all the appropriate permitting structures, um, including getting contacting the California Department of Fish and Wildlife for your lake and stream bed alteration permit, and then um, also contacting the local regional board for your water quality certification and Army Corps and everything else. Um, but the requirements are in the policy, so it allows the regional board to move a little bit faster in issuing those is, is what the hope is, so that those requirements are already there and they can say just follow these requirements or they could add a, additional requirements if needed. Um, and then of course management of fertilizers, pesticides, and petroleum, uh, cleanup, restoration, and mitigation on existing slopes, uh, proper soil cultivation is human waste disposal, and control of irrigation runoff. So now the staff report, um, as I mentioned, it kind of 
is kind of the rationale for the requirements. It does provide some back, a little bit more background and overview of, um, of the policy regions, the legislative background, and um, yeah, basically the requirements. And it also includes the water quality anti-deg analysis. So as a component of this, we are asking cannabis cultivators to go to storage. All surface water cannabis cultivators go to storage. So in order to help facilitate that move, um, a, a key component of this program is a small irrigation use registration program. So this one's going to be specific for cannabis irrigators or cannabis water diverters. Um, and this will become effective once the policy becomes adopted by or approved by Office of Administrative Law. Um, for now, we're asking that existing water diverters should continue to file their appropriate paperwork, and we'll kind of go into that a little bit later as well. Um, as far as if you're uh, if if you're a riparian user, you need to be filing your statement of diversion and use if you haven't done so. Um, if you're if you're storing water, you need to contact the water board to get in the appropriate um, permit structure on um, those types of things. And for for groundwater municipal systems or rainwater capture, um, you don't need to send anything to the water board. Uh, that, that's going to be a component of your of your California Department of Food and Ag's Cal Cannabis license. Uh, when you apply for that application, they're going to ask you your water source and, and you'll provide that information at that point. Um, one thing I do want to mention is that rainwater capture is pretty unique in this more standard setting. It's capture off of permanent buildings or structures. Um, when, when you start to have a pond that is capturing rainfall, or potentially uh, runoff from hill slopes gets a little bit trickier with the water right process. So if there's any type of a channel that's actually flowing into that, anything that's channelizing flow entering into that pond, it's technically on a um, water course, and you need a you would need to get a small irrigation use registration for that diversion. If it's just collecting, you know, just overflow over land flow that's not being channelized, then that's fine. So, no, now I'm going to turn it over. Yeah. All right. Exactly. There are seats. There's kind of, if you guys want to grab a seat, there's some open chairs and just paper. Thank you. Geologist with the Central Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board out of San Luis Obispo. Uh, myself and my colleague Leah are the cannabis unit for the Central Coast. Um, and so, so Dan is at the state level, the state creates the policy, uh, the regional board implements it. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to Lee and I because we are the people that are actually gonna be implementing the policy in the Central Coast. Um, and, and our region extends basically from Anya Nuevo in the north to Carpinteria in the south and as far inland as uh, Gilroy or, or Kuyama. Um, so the the flow request. So there's three three different documents. Um, if you go to the state board website, that um, basically establish the policy and give the background. And, and the first is the cannabis cultivation policy in attachment A, and those establish the water quality and flow requirements that need to be met. The next is the general order, and that's how the policy is actually implemented. And, and finally is the staff report, and that provides the background um, for the policy, how, how the state came up with uh, its rationale, basically. So there's been a lot of questions asked to us, both even from people within our own office, um, why is there a statewide general order for cannabis cultivation? Um, and, and basically, State Water Resources Control Board is tasked with regulating the discharge of wastewater uh, to surface water and groundwater, and actually, we're tasked to, well, yeah. And, and the mission of the, the Regional Water Quality Control Board is to preserve, enhance, and restore the quality of California's water resources and drinking water for the protection of the environment, public health, and all beneficial uses, and to ensure proper water resource allocation and efficient use for the benefit of present and future generations. Um, so, so again, why is there a statewide general order? And so this, this picture on this slide kind of describes why, in that um, historically cannabis has been grown in a very non-conventional, non-traditional manner. Um, this, is, this cultivation operation is on steep slopes, uh, timber clearing was required, 
close to a, a water body and there's high potential for erosion and, and sediment pollution to that water body. Um, so there's, there's been a, a number of kind of negative environmental impacts with the way that cannabis has historically been grown. Um, in addition, you know, it's, it's federal, federally listed as a Schedule One drug. So you may or may not know that there, there's an existing agricultural order from the Central Coast, and people have wondered why isn't cannabis just going to be under that existing agricultural order? It's just another agricultural commodity. But um, the fact that it's, a, it's still an illegal drug, according to the feds, is, is part of the reason why. Um, furthermore, that, that existing agricultural order for the Central Coast doesn't meet the requirements um, set forth by the state, so it can't fall under that existing agricultural order. And, and finally, there's been a relatively short rollout time for this new for these new requirements, and, and so doing a statewide order is much faster than doing a, a region-wide order. So, in addition, people are wondering, you know, why why is it not treated like a conventional crop? And there's again, there's been a number of instances where cannabis cultivation has had really negative impacts on, on water quality and the environment. So these, are, these pictures I'm going to show are all from the North Coast region, but the same types of practices have occurred in the Central Coast. And so you can see large accumulations of, of trash, pesticides and fertilizers, uh, erosion, sediment and sedimentation and turbidity. Uh, there's been septic waste found. This is septic waste discharging right next to a uh, surface water body. Um, illegal diversions of water and, and resultant reductions in in-stream flows that have occurred. So the next part is like, why, why do cannabis growers need to apply for coverage under this order? And so the, the reason that most growers will want to know is that enrollment and or registration in this order is required in order to receive your CDFA license. If you don't enroll in this order, you can't get a CDFA license. Um, Furthermore, the state says that merely the potential to discharge waste requires a waste discharge requirement, um, and so this general order covers everybody instead of requiring individual waste discharge requirements. And then finally, the, as Dan mentioned, individual and cumulative effects of diversions and discharges don't affect flows needed for fish and natural variability. So there, there are existing cannabis waste discharge requirements for regions one and regions five, which is North Coast and the Central Valley. Um, th those do not apply in, in region three, uh, the Central Coast. So if you're aware of those orders, don't, don't follow those orders because they're not going to apply here. Um, and actually those, those existing orders are, gonna be, are no longer going to be effective after July 1, 2018 in those regions. Yeah, so that. And so, basically, on, on January 1st, 2018, growers in the Central Coast are going to have to apply for the statewide general order. Let's turn it over to Leah for a little bit here. Yeah. My name is Leah Lemoyne. I'm with the, in, in the San Luis Obispo Office of the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board, um, Central Coast. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, more details within the order, specifically tiering and reporting, and where you may fall in this tiering structure. So um, James and Dan both mentioned this as well, but the implementation kind of day-to-day -day compliance, inspections, reporting, um, that you'll be dealing with the two of us. Um, so it's the intent that the state that the regional boards um, enroll all eligible discharges developing land for or engaging in campus cultivation. Um, so the state board will be doing the enrollment and then we'll be doing the implementation. Um, who is exempt and who is not exempt? So exemptions include personal use. If you are personal, uh, personal use, and from county to county this varies. I think in San Diego's it's six plants or 100 square feet, six plants. So if you're in that category, you do not need to enroll with this order. Um, if you are a commercial grower and you have less than 2,000 square feet, you're considered conditionally exempt. Um, <coughs> you will register with the order, but you will not be considered enrolled. So you'll pay an application fee, but you will not be paying annual fees. Um, there are exemptions for some indoor cultivation activities and that also requires exemption. So that includes if you are connected to a municipal sewer, 
um, so your waste is going to a sewer, a, a wastewater treatment plant, or you have an individual permitted treatment facility on site. Um, something to, important to remember or to know is that exemptions do not limit the Water Board's authority to inspect the site, evaluate conditional exemption status, or evaluate other water quality or water right regulatory requirements. So if, you're, if you fall into one of the exempt categories, you're still expected to meet all the requirements in Attachment A. Can I just interrupt and ask, so the, the exemption is for the water quality, so like the wastewater treatment? Just to be clear, what's exempt? Well, the, except from what? I exempt from the enrolling in the order. Mm -hmm. The order, which is the okay. the statewide order, and and so with that comes some uh, some reporting requirements and some fees you'll have to pay, which we'll, we'll discuss more about here. This is just an overview of the tiering structures. So there are sort of two categories girls be put into: a tier and then a risk determination. The tier is dependent upon area. So if there's conditionally exempt, less than 2,000 square feet disturbed area. Tier one, which is 2,000 square feet up to one acre of disturbed area. And then tier two, which is anything greater than one acre. So you'll be given one of those categories. And then in addition, depending on site specific um, characterization, you will be given a risk assessment. So if you are within the setback, and Dan mentioned the setbacks, and we'll talk about them a little more, but if you're within the setback, you're considered high risk. So that's um, a, a distance from the water body. And then if you have a slope, if your disturbed area, if any part of the disturbed area has a slope greater than 30%, you will be considered moderate risk. Um, and then if you don't meet either of those two categories, then you're considered low risk. And tier two won't be available until 2023. Okay. Um, the setbacks, the setbacks are. Um, <laughs> the setbacks are. Um, this is what's in the draft. It's not final, so keep that in mind. These may be changing a little bit, but um, so if you are roughly within the, within this distance to a uh, water course, then you could be put in. You will be put in the um, higher skirt. Now, as far as process goes, um, for tier one and tier, tier two growers will enroll, um, and then conditionally exempt growers will register. Everyone will pay an application fee, um, and then after your second year, enrolled growers will continue to pay annual fees. Um, once application once the application and fee are received, dischargers will receive documentation of application and enrollment, and that can be used for CDFA licensing. So from what I understand, you'll enroll online and then immediately be able to pay online and then immediately get that verification. Um, if you terminate, you must submit a notice of termination 90 days prior to ending cannabis activity, and there's some reporting requirements associated with that as well. So. Yeah, and we'll, we'll take some questions afterwards. Um, so, so each operation is going to be required a, a variety of technical reports depending on your, your risk class and your tier. Um, and so the, the reports are going to be due 90 days after um, your application is submitted, uh, except for your site closure report, which is due 90 days prior to termination of any cannabis activities. Um, and, and these best practicable treatment control measures, which are basically measures to reduce your threat to water quality, um, must be implemented by November 15th following your enrollment date. So if you enroll Jan 1, 2018, um, you have to have all that by November of 2018. Um, and if not possible, you must submit a site management plan. So here are the technical reports that are required. Um, so for Exempt or conditionally exempt, they, they have to submit a site, sub, or a site closure report uh, upon termination of cannabis activity. Um, for all tier one growers, you submit a site management plan and a site closure report. For tier one moderate growers, in addition to the, the site management and site closure, you have to submit a site erosion and sediment control plan. And for high risk growers, you have to submit a disturbed area stabilization plan. 
Um, and this is, again, this is once when you initially enroll. That's, you only submit these plans once. For a tier two growers, the requirements are exactly the same, except you have to submit additionally a nitrogen management plan. Um, and so the, these reports will need to be prepared by a, a licensed professional, a licensed geologist, or licensed engineer. So in addition to your technical reporting, which is due once when you enroll, you have annual reports that must be submitted as well. And so all enrollees must submit annual reports that detail winterization measures, tier status confirmation, and third-party identification. Third-party identification is if you have some cooperative that's doing some monitoring for you, um, you have to identify who that is. Um, tier 2 dischargers must also include nitrogen application information in their annual reports. Reports are due March 1, following the year but being monitored. So if you enroll January 1, 2018 and are growing in that year, that your first annual report will be due March 1, 2019. So for moderate and high risk dischargers, you have additional reporting requirements. Again, moderate and high risk is for steep slopes or close to a water body. Um, you must conduct monthly monitoring for various parameters and, and include the results of this monitoring in your annual reports. Um, and, and the monitoring parameters in, are, are listed there. I'm not going to read them all off. A lot of these are just merely observing your practices and noting that yes, my treatment controls are um, working correctly. The only two that really require you to make a measurement are turbidity and pH, and so those, those require some, some measurements. Um, you want to talk about groundwater wells? Or, or yeah. yeah. So, so we can cover these last two or just on the uh, what you should file with the State Water Board of Visual Water Rights. So if you have a groundwater well, as I mentioned, um, there's one nuance, which is if you're in a subterranean stream. A uh, subterranean stream is basically you're pumping surface water, but it's just taking it from the underflow of the creek. It's the easiest way to think about it. It's defined as a, as a subterranean stream flowing in known and defined banks. It's not the easiest thing to determine. Um, but if your well is really close to a stream and it's shallow and it's not lying very deep, likely you're pulling surface water. Um, if, if that is the case, then you would need to be filing a diversion or a diversion statement, a statement of diversion and use, um, which basically that, that diversion is considered a riparian water right. And if that is the case, then you're going to get kicked into the small irrigation program when that starts. Um, the things that you need to file are, are actually um, from the outside of complying with general water rights are for the to meet the legislation for that what you have to have done prior to get getting your license and so that's basically if you've been diverting surface water you need to file your statement of diversion and use um, if you have not been diverting yet but you plan to divert say next season if you're going to establish your your, um, your your cultivation site and everything, but you haven't diverted yet, then on our water rights website, which is hopefully, yeah, the webpage is up there, um, you'll need to file the B5 form. So we have a number of forms there for everybody in these different situations. Um, if you have a spring that you're, you want to notify us doesn't flow off your property so that you meet that requirement as well, there's there's forms there for that. And then, um, of course, the, the Canada Small Irrigation Use Registration will be available as soon as it's up and running and California Department of Food and Ag will also accept that when you walk in the door. And that's going to be pretty much the same for, I kind of covered both these at the same time, um, but the same for surface water. So these are our contacts. Sorry, I didn't, I missed this slide. Uh, so my phone, my phone number is not um, up there. Um, I think I might have some cards on me. but. Uh, on our website, if if you go to, uh, which I forgot to put that slide in as well, but if you go to, to the Water Board's main website, www.waterboards.ca.gov, and you go backslash cannabis, you'll be put into our, uh, you'll go straight to our general uh, cannabis website. And we have the same Water Board and our contact information you can find there as well, as, as along with all the uh, policy documents, staff report, and the general order, the drafts.
and that's what we have. So, questions? Well, and before we start, I just wanted to take a second just to jump in. Just for a second. Well, thank you all very much for presenting. And obviously, that was a very complicated uh, process that they uh, exposed you to. And I think it's a bit raw. You know, it's um, you're gonna you're gonna obviously need a little help filing these these reports because they're gonna need to track water quality and protecting the water quality and also making sure that the diversions that are happening do not destroy the watershed where these you know endangered fish live. And this is the concern. This is the bottom line. So that's all for you know, conservation and protection of the environment, but it's obviously sounds very complicated. So they're gonna walk you through that process. The, the, the regional water board is here, you know, they're gonna be your interface with the state board. Um, so they're gonna leave their contact information, which we'll, we'll put it back up on the slide. But um, I just wanna make sure you all know that, it, um, you know, it's gonna be a process, but these are things you're gonna need to do to get a state license and probably you'll need some assistance with a licensed professional at some point to kind of take care of a lot of these requirements for you. But um, feel free to check out their website. We'll probably post something on our cannabis website so you can find links easily and read through the basics. But um, now they're gonna just take some of your questions and, um, and then we'll go on. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna what the timelines are on these when we're going to actually need to start filing? Yeah, so for this region, um, your timeline is going to be as soon as the uh, policy is approved by the Office of Administrative Law, the online portal to, to register and get your WDR should be up and going by that point. So um, we're anticipating early December. And you can get in, it will be the same portal that we're setting up for your small irrigation use registration. So if you need to get, you can do them both at the same time, basically, so you don't have to duplicate information between the two. And initially, you just register to get basically your name in the system and such, and then the reports and such will be, that's going to come later. Is that correct? You have 90 days. Yeah, so it's 90 days, and then on the when you go in, there's there's there is quite a bit of information you're going to be asked as part of your application um, that you'll go through and fill out, and then you'll pay and send that off, and you'll be issued your um, notice of intent for people to file for notice under this policy. program. An option for people to file for what? The notice of non applicability doing the technical oh. reports to prove that you're not going to be discharging the waters in the U.S. Yeah, like recirculation. That is, it's, no, it, it, not, it's, not recirculation. it's only the way that there's the conditionally exempt, but, and then there's sites that are, that, that do not need to, to register at all. But if you're commercial, you have to go through this process in order to get your CDFA license. So there's not really a, I think I know what you're referring to, but it's more of a water quality specialty on that one than mine. Um, but th there's not a notice of non-applicability. You're either conditionally exempt or you're exempt. Does that make sense? Yeah. Probably just different terminology. So everyone needs to file, and yes. then they'll get routed depending on what they're doing on their property. If you're commercial, you have to register. And you'll get, if you're less than 2,000 square feet of your cottage, and you to start less than 2,000 square feet, you're going to get a conditional exemption piece of paper that you're going to need to give to CDFA. So what if you're not discharging, but you're growing commercially? You still need to enter into the program. Is there going to be a fee for the, um, to register an application for under 2,000 square feet? It's a one-time application fee. How much is that fee going to be? It's not established yet. Are they considering any amount? What's that? Are they considering any amounts right now? Um, I don't know where they're landing with that right now. When is it um, all going to get finalized? I don't think I caught it. I, no, I don't actually know the date that the fees are going to get finalized. I'm assuming that they will have those fees ready at the board adoption. So it will be part of the program at that point. Sometime in the year. Yeah, for anticipation right now, when, when we've been doing outreach, we're pointing to Region 5 and Region 1 fees. Uh, for for all part of, of where we might land. And what are those? I'm gonna stretch my memory. I believe that region one is one thousand for um, for uh, low risk, twenty five hundred for 
for moderate risk basically and 10,000 for high risk per year. So some people are licensed today, right? Not through Cal Cannabis. Okay. Um, the licensing program, right, they, they can get their, their local permits for medical right now, but right. there isn't any commercial um, don't use until 2018. Being that's a lot of people they didn't license at this point. So then the licensing is, if I understand it, it's going to be site specific, not grower specific? That's a CDFA question. I believe that it's actually grower. And well, you can, if you're a cooperative or an LLC, you would apply a certain way. Um, but if you're a site and there's different, and say there's two renters on one parcel, they're, they're separate licenses. When it comes to the, the erosion control plans, the all the various plans, you'd say they have to be a licensed engineer or geologist. Would a CPESC, Certified Professional for Erosion Sediment Control, are there other licenses? Those, those licenses carry pretty hefty price tags. Are there other people qualified to fill out those plans? There, there are. I understand. Yeah. Stormwater practice petitioners. Uh, are, are yeah, a list of, of acceptable ones on, from, on the website will be available? There's a list in the, um, that's defined as a policy. So there's a list of people that you would need to hire to figure out where you stand and what you're applying for, essentially, or? To help develop your plans. So, for example, th there's a number of requirements in the policy, and attachment A of the policy, that require uh, qualified professional, be that it depends on the nature of the um, of what you're doing. So if you're putting in a road, you're going to need to have some a qualified person come out and help lay out that road and design the road. Um, if you're doing in-stream work, you're going to have to have a qualified biologist come out to you know, evaluate for impacts for fish and those types of things. So it just kind of depends what it is. Um, but for the plants themselves, since, since these are the plants that are pretty much you're laying out, this is how I'm going to develop my site or if it's already developed, you know, but these are my erosion control measures I'm going to put in place. This is where I'm storing my pesticides and everything when I meet these requirements. All of that, um, a lot of those measures in order to meet the BPTCs or the requirements um, are typically designed by professionals and inspected, or if you have them existing, they would come out and inspect them to make sure that they're, that they're functioning. And that's what you think could be an ex a large expense on top of the license fee. It, it well, you know, you pay per hour okay. for these for these type books. So it depends what they're charging. Usually they're around fifteen hundred bucks, depending on what their license is. But I'm just guessing. So, this. You had a map of California broken down into different sections. What were the differences in the sections? Why were, why did you bother to break it down? Those um, we established as part of our long-term policy development. So right now we develop the interim requirements to kind of the, just apply statewide. And within those regions, we are targeting to develop more locally specific uh, requirements per by region, um, okay. which is mainly associated with the flow requirements. Uh, we took a real broad brush application to flow requirements for forbearance period. So as we get to that, as the resources allow, and we take a closer look at these regions, those flow requirements and forbearance periods may be adjusted and modified. So does that mean, sorry, does that mean you, can, you can get qualified under the state rules and regulations, but when Santa Cruz County develops their own, you could be bounced out? I mean, what is the risk of going with the state level development? Well, you're gonna, so you're gonna have to comply with whichever is more stringent but you need to get both. So the, the counties or the cities will have their local permit based on their ordinances that will have requirements in it and based on mitigation measures determined in the environmental impact report. The state water board with the waste discharge requirements has specific requirements that you're going to need to comply with through entering into that program. There's gonna be some overlap between those two and so whichever is more stringent is the one that you would comply with. Um, you're also, if you're doing anything like diverting water from a surface water or doing anything in stream work, CFW will talk about that in a moment, but you would need to get a lake and stream bed operation permit and those requirements may or may not, you know, still the most restrictive, always, most stringent will always apply. Does well, that? If, the, if the state is tracking to the end of the year 
of the application process in December. Is the county on the same timeline? The county is trying to be as close to the state timeline as it can be. The environmental review process takes a lot of time. Uh, and then the, the deliberation process takes time and there's always the potential for people to challenge uh, lawsuits. Um, coastal Commission will have to weigh in on every, all regulations in the coastal zone. Uh, so the county is as close to the state timeline as it can be and I think we're pretty much comparable with other jurisdictions. Um, you will have to have a county permit before you get a state permit. Um, you're going to have to have your uh, water board certification before you get a state permit. There's a bunch of things that have to get set up in, in place. And all jurisdictions are scrambling to get that January 1st timeline, and I doubt any of them are going to be there on January 1st. The state is committed to issuing some permits, but if you they can't get a water quality cert for them, they can't issue the permit. Yeah, I would, for what you need to get your license, I would pay attention to California Department of Food and Ag's regulations because there's a section, I'm not sure if they released their um, draft emergency regulations that include, that are combining adult and medical, but if you look back at what they released for medical, it, it will walk you through everything you need to have when you walk in the door to get your license, and it will outline all these things. Oh wait, I was over here first, in the, in the very back. I'm just curious if there's been any Uh, you would consider it illegal, <laughs> subject to prosecution. And I believe the, I, I'm not, I don't really track that side of the thing, but I believe the penalties for that activity has increased as well. And then over here. Grace period to fall under compliance? So the way it will work is you'll enroll in the in the um, WDR program, get your in the general order. You'll then develop your site management plan, whichever one you need to develop. And in that, you will identify the work you need to do. And you'll have, if you're not in compliance, then the component that you include is your compliance schedule and work schedule of what you're going to, how you're going to get into compliance with that timeline. That you'll submit to these guys and they'll review it and approve it or modify it. Is that that 90 days? The 90 days you have to get the, get the, get the uh, report into uh, okay. them, the initial one. Um, that could be filed with something that says, we're going to try and fall into compliance. Yeah, so you're, you're going to fall in one of two boats. Most people are going to fall in the latter. The first one is that your site's all buttoned up and it's been inspected and here it is, it's all buttoned up, I'm good to go. I'm not planning on doing anything new, so this is all I need to do. Um, most people are probably going to fall in, in the, the situation where there's going to be, you know, do as much as you can within these 90 with, by November 15th, but recognizing you're not going to be there by November 15th, you're going to be developing kind of your, your site schedule and compliance plan. So, you know, basically how you're going to, if it's, if you're a high risk, you know, you're going to need to be re relocating out of that repairing setback, so that would be one component. If you have it, you need to install erosion control measures and do other things to get your site up to meet the requirements of attachment A. You know, it might be, I've done these this year, next year I'm going to knock these ones off, and so on and so forth. And then the regional board will approve or, or may say, no, that timeline's not good, or, you know. Did you say you said November 15th, that's this year? No, no, that's next year. Okay. November 15th of each year. So you won't be enrolled yet. <laughs> the program won't be available until December. So you have next summer to get into, basically you'll still submit your site management plan 90 days from 90 days when you enroll. That, that's pretty much saying, hey, I'm here and I'm serious. Um, and then once that's submitted, then you're going to start doing the work that you have outlined in there uh, according to your work plan and time schedule. Are the requirements for the irrigation and the water quality certification the same for outdoor only? Or are there different requirements for temporary hoop houses, permanent hoop houses, greenhouses, or warehouses? Warehouses would be the exception. Uh, mixed light facilities are falling under the WDR. So your more permanent warehouse with uh, um, there, 
would not have erosion and would not have a 200 foot setback from a riparian or ephemeral street? That is going to be a county zoning is, is really where that's going to come into um, because it's, it's, it's a permanent structure so you'd go through the county zoning on that but the, the hoop houses and those type things would fall under the WDR. There's the, the, in, the completely indoor sites are a little treated a little bit differently as mentioned it, it depends whether or not you're hook connected to a municipal uh, system. If you're, if you're connected to a municipal septic system and you get approval from that septic system to discharge your cannabis waste to it, then you don't need to get a W, you don't need to go through the general order, you're actually going to be exempt, you still have to file that you're exempt. In, in addition, um, you need an impermeable, relatively permanent floor. Right. So that's kind of a dirt floor. Yeah, that would be a permanent greenhouse, concrete floor kind of. If, if, greenhouses aren't allowed to have concrete floors in San did you hear that? Greenhouses Green are not allowed Santa, to have. In Santa Cruz, if it's a greenhouse in ag, it's not allowed to have a concrete floor because of the preservation of soils. And there are some nuances to that depending on the operation. So we're looking at, you know, your typical indoor cultivation site is kind of in like the industrial section of a, of a city or, or area. Um, if, you're in, if your permanent site is located out in the middle of the woods, then you're probably going to be kicked into the program either because you're not connected to a septic system um, or you have a dirt road that's going out there and other, other disturbance that you've done to establish that site. So it's, it's kind of a case-by-case -case situation on those. Uh, they're, they're handled slightly different. So we want to take maybe one more question and then at the end we can, if there's still time, we can ask, throw back more questions to these guys. A couple minutes ago, you mentioned um, you for qualified professionals for certain things, and you mentioned road construction. The county has a grading ordinance that they issue permits under for road construction. Will the state, will the Regional Water Quality Control Board have its, its own requirements that are separate and apart from the county around those kinds of things? It's going to be whichever is more, more um, stringent. So basically, you know, there's most of our um, road construction requirements, we're asking that you develop the road to the standards that are outlined in the forest, forest practice rules. Not, not the forest practice rules, it's actually the, um, oh shoot, the road, we call it the roads handbook, it, but there's a specific book that it, that it refers to in the policy that has like, you know, how, how often you put in your culverts or your rolling dips, how to outslip your roads. All those types of things, and so it would probably intersect with the county, um, and one's likely going to be more stringent than the other. Um, but that would be something that you would want your the the person that's designing the road to, you know, look at both when they're designing that road. Did, did your rules take into account the fire code rules, the state fire code rules for access to commercial F1 occupancy? No, we don't. We just basically the where there's existing other rules we're just saying you need to comply with those and get any applicable permits okay there are um, more questions we can definitely take them at the end if you want to just remember it and i'll be i just don't want to run out of time on the other speakers so everyone moves along um, thank you very much so as you can see, you know you're probably going to need a team to get your project licensed. You know, if not at the county level, the state level, you're going to need some help. And um, now their contact information is here, but we'll make sure we also post it on the website so you can check. Give them a call um, to understand next steps. And uh, did you guys bring any flyers or anything? Um, oh, yes, I forgot. I have um, two handouts in the back. One's a simple fact sheet on the table outside. Um, the other is our. Notes of proposed rulemaking, which has all the information about where to find the documents, when the board meeting is, and everything else. Yeah. yeah, so there's contact information out there, don't worry. So, next we're going to move to, and I put the slide up um, in a second here, but we're going to move to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, we have Corinne Gray and Michelle Lester who are going to just kind of walk you through what, what applies on, on that front so you can get familiar. So, give me one second to open up the uh, presentation. Thanks. <laughs> Far right. Okay. Um, as we get this up and running, hi, my name is Corinne Gray or Corey. Uh, Michelle Lester is sitting here in the front row in purple. We're both here from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Watershed Enforcement Team. 
Um, we're, bo we're both based out of the Yonkville office for the Bay Delta region for the department. It deemed it me. Um, so basically, the department's authority is pretty broad. It's a kind of a big job with a little itty bitty department. But uh, we have jurisdiction over conservation, protection, management of fish and wildlife, native plants, and all their habitats necessary, necessary for sustainable populations. There's multiple fish and game code sections that you may or may not become familiar with as you go through this process. The first one and the foremost one is 1602. This is what we call a lake and stream bed alteration agreement. And it is a permit that's required for the alteration of bed bank and channel. Um, this can include water diversion as well. 5650 or 5652 is a prohibition on the de uh, delivery of sediment to waters of the state. This is actually comes into play more often than not when we're looking at enforcement actions. And then 5937, which requires that if you have a facility like a dam or a diversion that you need to bypass sufficient flow to keep fish in good condition. And of course, 5901, which prohibits uh, preventing fish passage for creating barriers and streams. We also have uh, other authorities. We've got the California Endangered Species Act. Uh, and here we have a long-toed salamander from the Santa Cruz, so that's what that is. Um, we have fully protected species that we look into. And then, of course, again, lake and stream bed alteration agreements. The one thing that is different and interesting about our department, all of these laws and all of these code sections don't just apply to cannabis. These are not new. Everything that I'm going to talk about today applies to your neighbor, regardless of what they do. It applies to cannabis. It applies to cities and municipalities. So these actual code sections have been in place for everybody, not just cannabis. We have 20 plus uh, special status species in the Santa Cruz County area. <laughs> Coho salmon, which hopefully everybody here knows about. That's a big one down here. It's uh, both state and federally endangered in Santa Cruz County. Foothill yellow-legged frog, which has recently um, become, a, become a candidate species for our department, so it may become potentially listed. Marble roulette, which is something that comes into play if you're planning on doing any type of activity in old growth uh, redwood forests or old growth forests. And then California red-legged frog. So these are just a couple examples of the 20 plus species that we have interest in and we're looking at in Santa Cruz County. So for the purpose for the rest of this particular presentation, I'm just going to focus on the things that are really going to be important to you. When you're going to be applying for a stream and alteration agreement from our department, there's really two big activities that we focus on. Water diversion and then stream crossings. So a lot of the questions that we field when we're in the office is when and why do you need a stream bed alteration agreement? You need a stream bed alteration agreement from our department if you substantially divert or obstruct the natural flow, if you change any material from the bed bank or channel of a stream, or if you deposit debris, waste, or other materials. Another question that we constantly field when we're at the, in the office is what is a stream? Um, their streams could be episodic, they can be perennial, uh, it could be a well that's adjacent to a stream where you're diverting subsurface flow, that could be jurisdictional. It could be the floodplain of a body of water. It could be an activity that, uh, in go, uh, an activity that occurs in a lake, pond, or any type of wet area as well. If you need to apply for a stream that alteration agreement from our department, um, and to be perfectly honest, every person who's getting a state license from CDFA will likely need to apply for a stream bed alteration agreement from our department. As it's written, you either need to have a stream bed alteration agreement from us, or you need to have something written that says you don't need one. So in order to get either of those items right now, you will have to fill out this notification. If and when you fill out the notification, there's a couple things you should keep in mind. Really, there's no downside to providing too much information to us on this. It should be accurate and detailed. Any type of reports that have been developed, you've heard about other agencies, you're going to need some site plans. You're going to want to talk to somebody about your road development. You're going to want to talk to somebody about your, well, <clears throat> your wells, any type of well completion report that you might have. Include those materials in the application. 
We have gotten some awkward things like your grocery list and whatnot. If, but you don't need to be that. It doesn't need to be that inclusive. But any type of permits that you've gotten from other agencies, if you have a water right, photographs are huge for us. It's in everybody's best interest to provide us with so many photographs that we don't even have to go out on your property. <laughs> so that's not an incentive. Um, fill out the form, of course. All necessary fees. Again, the fees are the same for you as they would be for anybody else. And if applicable, uh, attachment C, so that is the attachment you would need for a stream, I'm oh, sorry, for a diversion, including wells. And attachment E. Attachment E is actually the only thing that's special to cannabis. If you have conducted work without a stream of alteration agreement, and you have to clean it or fix it, you do need to submit an additional fee, and that's called the remediation fee. And you would have to file us an attachment E. I'm not joking when I say this. We've gotten some very incomplete applications. It's in no one best district. This was the project description I received on a recent application for a dam repair. It's pretty, it gives us a good chuckle. It kind of made my day a little bit, but you know, you can add that to the rest of your really thorough and complete information you submit with your application. So let's get some clarification on some other questions that we regularly receive about stream bed alteration agreements. What is a stream? I had a 15 minute argument with a man who was telling me he didn't need a permit because it was a crick and not a stream. <laughs> a crick is a stream. Also, there's a lot of confusion about Cal Fire regulations. You know, you hear the terms class one, class two, class three. Regardless of the class, if it is a stream, something even as little as this, it's likely jurisdictional and would need a notification from us. These are examples of some class two streams. These are kind of more obvious. You've got cobble, you've got gravel, gravel. We really don't get into too many arguments about these. Here's some more examples of small streams that some people don't realize need a stream of alteration agreement. If you have a culvert in a road, I would kind of err on the side of caution. That's probably a stream. If you feel like you need to install a culvert, you might consider looking at that as a stream. Here's an area where we had a stream come out of an upper hillside and spread out on a field. Pigs love it. This would be considered a stream under our code. So why is in-stream flow so important? Fish need water. Fish need water for all of their life history stages. We have multiple endangered and threatened species in these systems. They need them to produce food. So even if you don't have a fish bearing stream, even if your project's not on a stream, if your project is upstream, you're producing food. You're producing a clear source of water. You're producing good dissolved oxygen conditions. So even activities that occur in these really high up watersheds are really important to the species downstream. Sorry. <coughs> now, the second question we get. Now we've decided, now we all know that a stream is jurisdictional. You need a stream bed alteration agreement from our department if you're going to conduct an activity in it. The next thing is, what is substantial? If you have a substantial diversion, and this again is non-cannabis related and cannabis related, you would still it would be you would still need to apply, and we would need to give you a stream and alteration agreement. So if you're diverting water during periods of low or no flow, or if your diversion is actively changing, if there's a measurable or a visible change in surface elevation, that is considered substantial. And because of that, our department will likely put, put conditions on that project that would limit this type of effect. Wells, that's another thing that people have questions about. I cannot tell you how many times someone has told me, it's a well, I don't need a stream bed alteration agreement. I've had people come up and say it's 200, 300 feet, but it's a, if it's a shallow well, you may need a stream bed alteration agreement. There's a little bit of a difference between how the state board regulates it and how our department re regulates it. As Dan mentioned, <clears throat> if you have a well, if it's in a defined subterranean stream, that's a water right. You need to file either a statement of use or if uh, you're storing an appropriate water right. But for us, we're mostly concerned about whether or not you're diverting natural flow. So if your well is 200 feet away from the stream, if it's 10, 20 feet deep, that's probably still diverting natural flow. If you are a 200 foot well, 
and you're really close, that might still be diverting natural flow. The only way that we can know is through looking at well completion logs and other factors. And the only way you will know is if you apply for a stream of alteration agreement. <coughs> so here's where I get really repetitive. If you're diverting from a stream or a spring, you will likely need a streambed alteration agreement from my department. If you have a well that is diverting stream flow, you will likely need a streambed alteration agreement from my department. Do I, I don't need to keep going. I mean, it's really, you guys are probably going to need to get a streambed alteration agreement from our department. Just need one. Everybody. <laughs> so, what are you in for? If you apply for a stream alteration agreement from our department, our staff are going to be doing everything possible to make sure that whatever permit we issue is going to be consistent with most of the other agencies who you're working with. If not all, we're trying. And so one of the things that you're going to need to look into and that we're going to condition it with is bypass flows, your rate of diversion, right now it's about 10 gallons per minute, based upon where it is and how deep the well is, or if it's a well, or it's, it, there might be a period of forbearance, just like Dan was mentioning. If you have forbearance, which I have to say is probably everyone in here is going to have some type of forbearance, prepare for it. You will need to be able to store water. That is a reality. Plan for it now. <coughs> So, if you are going to plan for storage, now this 180 days guidance is for every everybody too. We you know we recommend 180 days, but for the purpose of cannabis, keep an eye on what the um, principles and guidelines are going to look like. As I think it was what November 1st through March 31st. Yep. That means that you would only be able to divert during those time frames. That means that you cannot divert water between April 1st and. October 31st. So if your irrigation season is during the summer, you will need to store enough water to fully irrigate your product just from storage. So just keep that in mind. There's multiple ways. You can have a reservoir, you can have an on-stream dam. Sorry, reservoir and on-stream dam are kind of the same things. You can have a tank, you can have on-stream reservoirs. Um, there's different pros and cons associated with those. But the message that I want to give you is if you are looking at doing any type of reservoir, you need to talk to a professional. Because when those things fail, it's not just you it affects, it affects everybody downstream. It is in your best interest to talk to a professional. So here's a water diversion that's got a little screen on it. This is a good water diversion. This is not a good diversion. Um, any type of excavation of stream. Uh, springs, anything along that line, first off, you would need to get an agreement from us, and we would not let you do this. <laughs> Is this a good location for your pond? Talk to your professional. We have seen some crazy ponds. This is not a good idea. It shouldn't have the best view in your property. It should be the curve on the side. <laughs> you want to make sure your spillway, like your spillway needs to be properly conduct, uh, con conducted, constructed, because if something's going to fail, it's going to be your spillway. If you've got cracked spill anywhere on your property, you've got a problem. This is some, um, I mean, I could give you hundreds of these pictures of unpermitted on-stream ponds with um, tarps that they bought from Home Depot. This is not the way that you want to do your project. This one doesn't have a spillway, so I guarantee you when it does spill, it's not going to go the place you want it to go. And I don't know why, but it seems to always go after house, houses and swimming pools. <laughs> When you construct your outflows, you want to make sure that you are properly securing them. Now, I do need to, to let you guys know, I'm telling you these things not because I want you to construct your own ponds, but if you have a consultant or a contractor or a licensed engineer who's like, don't worry, it's fine, I don't need to rock the outlet of my pond, you should probably second guess that. This is not a really good place to put your outflow. It's on the top of a hill. Basically, I think it's just going to erode the fill material of the dam, and that thing's going to fail. Building a wetland, building a pond on a wetland is probably not a good idea. It's going to trigger a series of other permits that, considering it's not federally legal right now, you cannot get a core permit. 
And so I don't know if you guys can see the little people in the far right corner, the little tiny people. I would not want to be this guy's downstream neighbor because that, that reservoir is about ready to go. So again, make sure they're engineered and make sure you talk to a professional if this is the route you decide to go. <clears throat> stream crossing. So a couple tips for stream crossings. Again, hire a professional first, but if you do hire a professional and they try to tell you anything other than these things, you might consider finding another professional. You need to salt, uh, sorry, size your culverts to pass a 100-year storm plus any type of debris at a minimum. You can do it bigger. Bigger is always better. They should be set to grade, aligned, and extended beyond the fill of slope. So not just the, the road, but the fill of slope. And what you're going to find, and honestly, I haven't been in a culvert store lately, but I've heard that they're standard 20 feet. 20 feet is not going to work for most roads. You're going to need a longer culvert. Rock armoring may be required to dissipate energy and reduce erosion, but if you're relying upon concrete wings or a lot of rock armoring, you might consider ups upsizing your culvert because that's a sign that you're eroding around it. Um, but again, bigger, bigger is always better. Consult with your professionals on how to size these things. Here's my, my slideshow of culvert. Oh, <coughs> that didn't work. Oh, that's even worse. Um, sorry, so you can probably see, I have no idea how that happened. You know, there's a concrete to the right is a multi-pipe culvert. Um, that's not something that our department generally recommends, and we rarely, never issue permits that allow for multi-pipe culverts. If you're putting in a new stream crossing, we want one big culvert, because when we get those high flows and you get one branch that comes down and it blocks it, it just packs up debris behind it, and you're more likely for ha to have it fail. This is what a failed culvert looks like. All right, so this is, this is a, a picture that came from our associates up north, but I, I really enjoy this one because it kind of tells a story. It's a bad one, first off, but I don't know, if you look at the culvert, you can see that the scour, you can usually tell about the sizing of a culvert based upon the amount of scour on the bottom. And you can see from this one that the scour is kind of sideways. So this is not the original placement of this culvert. This was somebody's idea of recycling. This is really not the thing you want to recycle. So what happened is someone probably had this culvert in. It's probably slightly undersized. It blew out, rolled downhill, ended up in somebody's back lot. Somebody thought to save a couple dollars, install it in this project. But now we've got a situation where <clears throat> they haven't armored the inlet or the outlet. It's obviously not. The, length of the road fell. And so this thing's probably going to fail, roll downstream, someone will pick it up, put it in the back lot, and hopefully you guys will not buy it. <laughs> Poorly designed culverts can destroy your property. <clears throat> if you're going to spend some money, and I'm sorry, I know tonight sounds like we're just asking you to spend money, but if you are going to invest in your road infrastructure, it will pay you dividends, because if something fails, it costs so much to fix it. it. All of the adverse effects to fish and wildlife, what happens when your downstream neighbors find out about it, um, could be your upstream neighbors, it depends on how bad it is. But this is an investment in your property. Do it right, do it right once, do it right the first time. So here's the tough love part of this. So Michelle and I are actually part of the watershed enforcement team. Our job is to work with our enforcement staff to look at environmental crimes associated with cannabis. One of the interesting things, and another one of the special things about cannabis, but not necessarily everybody else, is if some, if cannabis grower does uh, any type of, not does, but if we find environmental crimes, culverts that were installed without permits, culverts that were in, improperly installed, erosion, anything along that line, there are enhanced fines associated with that. This is kind of some of the things that we see a lot. Um, storage of equipment in improper places. People tend to want to dispose of their debris in a creek. It seems like a really obvious place. You know, you put it there at the beginning of the winter, it's not there at the inner, end of the winter. But unfortunately, that's a, thing. a flyer in the back, which has all of Michelle's contact information. <laughs> Michelle covers Santa Cruz County. We do have other staff coming. Uh, but right now, Michelle uh, is, Call me 
all. That's all, that's all Michelle all the time. And luckily, Michelle has a lot of local expertise. She actually used to be the department's fisheries biologist for Santa Cruz County. So here's our contact information. Again, Michelle's is on here, mine isn't. <laughs> Uh, but Michelle probably uh, would be the better person to contact. Obviously, you can contact me if uh, something else comes up and, and you, you think you want a better answer. No, don't call me. But uh, we do have other staff. So if Michelle gets overwhelmed, if we get an influx of applications, we do have other people who can help you. So these are the kind of messages that I wanted to end this presentation with, if you haven't gotten it yet. Well, first off, Submit your stream of alteration agreement application for the department. It sounds like you're going to need either an actual <laughs> agreement for us or a letter stating you don't need one. So you might as well start that now. Second, it's a business expense. You guys are, this is your business. And you should consider maintenance of your property part of your business expense. If you want to do it, do it right. Make sure that you invest in your infrastructure because the worst thing in the world is to have something happen and not be able to get to your property. And please talk to a professional, whether it's Michelle or a consultant or some of the lo local um, area resource conservation districts or anything along that line. Talk to somebody about what you think you need to do on your property and make sure that they know what they're talking about. So if you have any questions, please let me know. I'll be here for the rest of the night. Michelle's here as well. And uh, thank you. I know, oh. I know, but before you all go out and, and put in your application for the stream bed alteration, make very sure that the property you have is going to be allowed under our program, because if you go through the whole process, it'd be great to improve the property, but you may be moving. We don't know that yet, so pay close attention to what the board does in terms of what is and isn't allowed. Wait, you can improve the property. By all means. At any time. At any time. You can put tulips and improve your property. So, does anybody have any questions for Fish and Wildlife steps? Forget the first one. What's that? Like, leave it? Okay. Forget the first slide. Oh, forget it. Okay, so um, if there were any questions uh, for the Fish and Wildlife uh, team, we can, we can ask at the end. I just want to move right on to Rich Sampson. He's with CAL FIRE. Um, Rich is our Division Chief Forester 2, and he's going to you know, take you through um, everything that CAL FIRE does, which is very relevant to anyone you know, in the Santa Cruz Mountains especially, but not just there. Rich. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I uh, apologize for this presentation. I finished it up this afternoon. I've been a little busy on some other uh, part of my job. <laughs> uh, so forget the first one. There we go. So you're probably asking, why is this fire guy standing up in front of you to talk about the <clears throat> California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, our job is to deal with watershed, just like uh, watershed issues and protecting watershed and uh, the environment, just like the other agencies that are talking to you right now. Most of our department deals with fire suppression. About 98% of the department does. The rest of us, uh, a lot of the rest of us deal with timber operations on timberland. So where do I fit in? Well, I regulate timber operations. I regulate timber operations on timberland in the state of California. So first, is, what is timberland? So Public Resources Code 4526, simply if you have land not owned by the federal government and it's capable of and available for growing a crop of trees, you are on timberland. Okay, what does that mean? If you are essentially above Highway 1 in Santa Cruz County, odds are you're on Timberland. If it's growing redwood, Douglas fir, ponderosa, pine on it. If it used to grow redwood, Douglas fir, and ponderosa, pine on it, and it's a brush field now, it's still Timberland. I'll go into a little bit of that as part of this. As far as crop of trees, uh, that's where I'm talking about redwood, Douglas fir, and ponderosa, pine. Those are the species that the Board of Forestry has designated for this area. Well, I am going back. There we go. 
Then we get to timber operations. Just because you're on timber land doesn't mean you have something that's going to be under my jurisdiction. Timber operation is there's essentially, instead of all this gobbledygook, there's, there's a A rule and a B rule. The A rule, everybody's pretty well familiar with. You go out on timber land and you cut trees down, you process them into forest products, you sell, barter, or trade them for services, you're conducting a commercial timber operation. That's what most everybody figures is what I regulate. That's what I thought when I first started. The B rule is when you start talking about timberland conversion. So if you have timberland, timberland in this state is, uh, according to the, our rules, is supposed to be devoted for growing timber and for watershed uses. And the most of the policy that we're dealing with, the intent was to keep as much land in timberland as possible to maintain watersheds. So when you want to change the use of that from growing trees to some other use, whether it's a vineyard or putting a house in or a road in or a marijuana grow, or if you want to put in some type of a freeway, you're changing it from growing trees to another use. That's conversion of timberland. Then you're doing the timber operation. As soon as you get to that point, you need to you come under my jurisdiction and you have to get a permit you have to use licensed timber operators to do the work, and you probably need a licensed forester as your professional to guide you through the process and get your permits. So that's how I get into it. So what's timberland up here? This would be timberland. Odds are this is not this is not this is actually up in Oregon, but trees were all cut down. It doesn't become something else unless you change its use. That's a clear cut, it's probably going to grow back in trees eventually, and it's still timberland. This is timberland here. Uh, this is up near the summit. <coughs> the issue is, is it doesn't talk about how many trees need to be on here. I guess this isn't going to work for me. Uh, you can notice in there, every so often, there's a Douglas fir tree uh, growing on there. That makes it in the timberland. It's mostly oak. But if Douglas fir can grow on it, it's still timberland. Same thing on this slide. There's redwood still growing up. Argument I'm usually up against when I come out on a property like this is well, the redwood's over there. I put the building pad over here, so this isn't timberland. Well, if you look at this site in aerial photos historically, if a redwood tree is growing right over here, odds are a redwood tree could probably grow over here and grow over there. That's how they've been, we've been interpreting the rule for about 40 years. This is timberland. If you look real close, you'll see small Douglas fir coming up. It's capable of growing a crop of trees. Doesn't mean the crop of trees is going to be available like most industrial timberland in say 50 years or 100 years and maybe 400 years. The government, the legislature didn't differentiate in that. It's timberland, it's capable of growing trees. That's not timberland. <laughs> then we start, uh, I think, I'm hoping the rest of the slideshow is still in order. Um, let's talk about products, forest products. This is what you're probably used to seeing, the, a deck of logs. That would be a forest product that we would be looking at. Firewood, it's coming off the timberland. That's still forest product. We regulate the, the harvesting of that forest product of the different, off of different properties. So it's not the fact that you're moving firewood, it's that somewhere on timberland, somebody cut the firewood and processed it. I'm going after and trying to regulate where they cut it and making sure they're following the forest practice rules and the way they cut it and how they're treating the land. Redwood burl is still a forest product. We're still, when you're digging that out of the ground, you're doing timber operation. This would be a timberland conversion. As you can see, there's some uh, Douglas fir in different, uh, on either side of the road. Um, they went and cleared the ground and it's changed it into a road use. That would be a conversion. This would be another conversion. Obviously, you're in a redwood forest. Another conversion. This would be another conversion. Terracing and putting the uh, slash down below. 
pulling up trees where you actually have the, the stumps where I can see them, or like this one where you have all the root balls. Essentially, if I come out on a property and I see the root balls, if you're going to the trouble of removing the roots from the ground, you're converting it to some of the use. You don't want those trees growing back. That's essentially, a, that's the whole case in an enforcement uh, operation. So when you have conversion permits, you need to get the permit in the first place. You're going to have to, uh, unlike some of the earlier presentations, the fact that you're doing a timber operation requires you to use licensed professionals. They're required to sign off on the permits and do the preparation. So if you're doing a conversion, your first thing you need to get a hold of is a uh, licensed forester. Uh, I have my contact information at the end of this, but you can contact our office. We have a whole list of foresters that are practicing in, in this area. They would go through, they would come out to the property and walk you through as one of the professionals. This is what you can do and what you can't do. You can also ask them to come out and determine whether it actually is timberland or not. You also need a licensed timber operator to do the work, to cut the trees down, to uh, do the investigation <coughs> until you turn it into another site and actually convert it. Once it's been converted, you've gone through your permit and all my uh, requirements on the permit, then you're into building, then you're going to be dealing with county building and all their code enforcement. As part of a, uh, the two different types of permits you can go for is the less than three acre conversion exemption. Odds are that's the permit that you're going to be getting. The, B, the clearing has to be less than three acres. It can be spread out in small polygons across the property, but you can't clear more than three acres. It would exempt you from the full <coughs> conversion permit process. Full conversion permit process is probably going to take eight months to a year. It's essentially requiring an EIR. So if you have a large vineyard, and now that you would put in and you're going to be clearing more than three acres, you're going to have to go through the county and get your permit from them, plus go through essentially the IR process and have that approved before you can go for a full-scale timberline conversion permit through our process. After that, you have to get a timber harvest plan to go ahead and remove the trees. A less than three-acre conversion permit will probably take about a month of preparation and notifying the neighbors, having the forester uh, fill that out. Uh, within a month, if everything's correct, you should have your permit and you'll have a year to go ahead and act on that. But again, you'll need a county planning signature that you're complying with all county rules and regulations for that exemption. The exemption is taken, uh, when we put exemptions in, we're looking at this project being low impact. The full scale conversion permit assumes that you're making a large project. That's why it's such a big process. As far as fees, there's no fees for going for our permits, but you are going to be paying the professional to get you through the process. And does this follow the individual? Um, you know, like say you're doing some in other parts of the state. I thought this is something that. Well, that's, uh, the less than three year conversion does have a lot of restrictions on it. One of them is that one land a landowner can only use that card once. So what we were having back in the 80s is some developers were going through and they were buying all these properties up and subdividing them in little one acre parcels and then they were clear cutting them for their development and then disappearing. They decided no you can only use this once otherwise you need to look at the entire project which is the whole big parcel otherwise it's piecemealing and you would have to go get the full conversion. Uh, so <coughs> that's why you're stuck underneath that those requirements. Uh, in, real quick, in terms of the county signature on that under three acre conversion, the county can only sign off on it af after you've actually gotten your permit. So if your property requires a house and you're clearing for the house as well as a grow site or a grow room or, or trimming sheds, all of that, you have to get your permits in place for those before you get your conversion permit and before you take out the trees. Okay. I locked it up again. There we go. Okay, I'll leave that with the context. So, what I recommend is if you're moving, going to move forward on this, is get a professional out there uh, if you're, before you start clearing. 
One thing to keep in mind uh, as far as the enforcement uh, process for us is this is a rule, these rules have been in for 40 years or more. These are what we're enforcing now. We have no new rules that have gone through the, the legalization process. We're just doing what our job has been for the last 40 years. We cannot give permits retroactively. So if you've already gone out and have completed your conversion or acted on your conversion, I can't go out there and say, oh yeah, pay this $1,500 fine or whatever. We're going to give you an after the fact permit. Unfortunately, that's a court case we lost about seven years ago. So if you've already converted, I can't help you with that. You're already, you already have a problem. And that's what I believe, mean, especially with the time. Clear down trees? If you're clearing down trees, as long as you're not going to take those down trees and get rid of them, and then change the use of where those trees were, like if, if you're going to put in a grow where there were trees and they fell down, you are going to be, you're, going to, you're converting timberland because if those trees were left and you didn't use it for something else like growing, the trees, another new tree would be able to come back up. So we're looking at the long term in the corner. So I'm not sure your last statement, you said if someone uh, clears, you, they can't come in and get an after that permit to you? That's correct. How then? They have no, no, no alternative other than to leave it and let it be established as forest land. That is one method, yes. Right. So if if you've you already cleared the forest before you got your permit, you're in violation. You're in violation? How do you correct that violation? Uh, you would have to restore the site. You can't go through a conversion permit? No, I cannot issue you a conversion permit after the fact. That's something that was used to be done in the past. Yeah, but that. it's been. Well, if, someone else previous owner does right. it, if your property has been, if we find that it's been converted, when we find it and you start changing the use of it, you're, it's still going to be an illegal conversion. Rich, what if you what if you plant, go through and do a restoration? You plant it with trees. Right. How long does it need to establish before you can then do a conversion? If, if we can go back out there and determine it's, it's growing trees again and the problems have been restored, if you have this big, a big uh, cut slope's been removed and you have a big building pad there that's been recontoured and we have trees growing again, well then you can go ahead and go for your application. What if you purchase new property like that years prior and you haven't done anything to it but it's like that already? Can you apply for a conversion permit? If somebody already converted prior to, but that's something we're going to have to look at. There's, um, I mean, I'll be upfront, there's some cases out here where we've gone out and people have converted themselves and we told them, hey, you're breaking the law. We started a process and they started a restoration process. And if they disappeared and the restoration process wasn't completed, the new owner can't come back out and pick up where it was already illegal converted and carry on. It has to be restored. So, um, kind of off the subject of the tree cutting, but to Cal Fire. So I had a, a pre-license inspection done, and I feel like one of my biggest concerns, and I'm sure of the county too, what I heard from inspectors, was with the Cal Fire's requirement for water storage for greenhouses. Um, they're saying it could be somewhere between 20,000 and 120,000 gallons. Um, What's your question then? Is it, I, well, you guys, when they came out, they said that wasn't gonna be like environmentally, to pull that much water from the watershed in Santa Cruz, if everybody put up greenhouses, obviously that, that probably wouldn't work. If, are you guys gonna have any leniency on the water storage requirement for greenhouses? Well, I think if you remember why we're putting those requirements there, it's for public safety. Okay. If you need to have a certain amount of water for fire protection in case there is a fire, and believe me, there have a lot of fires that I've been dealing with lately, I'm similar to that, and the water isn't there, we can't put out the fire. So there is, why would you not have the meet the requirement 
if you want to maintain the safety. And so all another thing to pull out of the ground. Well, then what the interpretation that we've taken is sometimes some properties are not appropriate for use for some of the use other than growing trees. I mean, would you want to put a grill on a on a cliff? No. That but I think this would be anybody putting up a greenhouse has to have <coughs> the water suppression storage requirements. So it's, it's it's every property. It's not like it's it's anybody that puts up a greenhouse and a warehouse. Anything that requires a building permit. Right. Yeah. With the the planning department that gets triggered to fire. Yeah. And Rich is not really working in the fire suppression side. He's okay. He's dealing with the land conversion part. Okay. Although he yeah. is Cal Fire and does yeah. deal with fire. <laughs> but but I think it's case by case though. Okay. So every property, depending on how close it is to the forest and and uh, what structures are near it, it'll. It, the, the, the so even if the county code that, says that you need so many gallons for this size structure, you guys might be willing to be a little lenient. So, so I, I would say lenient is the word. It just <laughs> depends on the, the fire hazard present, okay. proximity to uh, fuel ignition sources okay. and what's I, going I, on. I own a vineyard and we have like a two acre storage pond. Yeah. Um, and we were trying to figure out a way to use that storage pond as a way for fire suppression because it has so many millions of gallons of water. but we were saying the fire might not be able to meet fire code that way. Um, oh, using the pump. Yeah, my, yeah, my understanding is it has to be a, there has to be a fire hydrant that has yeah, to flow. Exactly. And so a, a reservoir doesn't meet those standards. Yeah. But and it they, seems like a lot of if everybody puts up the maximum amount, if you guys give permits out and everybody puts greenhouses or warehouses, it just seems like a, at least the code inspectors are saying that this doesn't seem rational to pull. 50 million gallons of water from the Santa Cruz watershed just for to put in storage for, for cannabis production. I think uh, when in your case you need to talk to one of your professionals. Okay. They may they need to examine that because I don't think you have all the information. There on is your case. in in the uh, in the EIR we do have some mitigations to try and lessen that water demand. One of it is okay. if you are doing a greenhouse, you're going to capture all the rainwater from that greenhouse and put it in that tank. Okay, so. You, you, if you have neighbors who are also growing, and, and you can pump from your pond to that tank. Okay, cool. Um, as long as the tank has the right head on it. Okay. Um, if you have neighbors who are also growing, you can share the tank, so it's not for every structure. It's for, it, it, you just have to have a, a hydrant that has that flow at each structure. All right. So you. there are some measures. That, but, that and, and there is, uh, the, the fire, uh, Cal Fire does have on a case-by-case -case basis, they can look at what you have in the field, and they can. There is a, a chart that they can look at that is part of their code that allows them to to have reduced amounts. But they cannot commit to anything like that until you go through the process. They come out and evaluate it. So that range can be 20 to 160, but it's most it's likely going to be on. Yeah. You know, it's it, if you have your other your your um, defensible space clearance, you have adequate <coughs> access. Uh, you've done everything that you can to minimize that risk. There's a good chance you're you're going to be under a hundred thousand anyway. That storage is going to be distinct from the storage for irrigation. Okay. If Keep in mind, I'm talking about forest practice rules. What you're talking about is the fire marshal rules. This is a mm -hmm. Cal Fire employee, but he's working to enforce the county code, okay. the county fire code. Okay. I'm talking about the timber timber rules. Okay. Course, you wanted to well, I was going to say, if you're pulling surface water for your fire protection, that does need a water right. But even if it's a man-made storage pond that's permitted for fire? It, you, you would, it, it needs a water right if you're okay. storing it. You have to go through their process. It's, okay. it's just the process. And the but small it's fees, irrigation allows it's more fees well. and applications. So. <laughs> <laughs> that water to your neighbor uh, for their so My question is, if there is a property that's been clear and conversion in the past, Coming for a new building permit for, say, greenhouse, will... A property is, no, what, uh, if you are commercializing it, so if you cut firewood on your property and you sell it, give it away for trade, for services, then that's uh, commercialization. You would need to have a permit for that, as long as you're doing it on, on Timberland. Well, first, Can you the uh, what's the first step to get somebody for to get us to come out and take a look at uh, the situation? 
first I need to warn you, uh, myself and one other forester, we deal with timberland for five, all the, the five bay, southern Bay Area counties. So what we recommend is that you get a licensed forester before you start coming to us in the, um, because we might end up in the enforcement process. I would go to the list of licensed foresters <laughs> and talk to them first. Okay. What if there is uh, timberland, redwood timberland, that um, was logged maybe 80, 100 years ago, subsequently planted with apple trees? Has it been converted? If the apple trees are still there and growing and occupying the site, that's an orchard. We've we consider that's been converted a long time ago. Uh -huh. And do you have, and what is your role in terms of taking down those apple trees? And there is, it's no longer timberland, I don't have any jurisdiction. Okay. So a lot of what we're doing on some of these properties, when we look at the old aerial photos, somebody would come to us and say, hey, there's a development occurring on this property and it's timberland, so we'll go and we'll look at it uh, on the aerial photos first. And if it's a clearing that shows to be a clearing for the last several years, uh, that usually ends it. But if it's borderline where there's a few trees popping up and they turn out to be conifer, probably rather than Douglas fir or ponderosa pine, then we're gonna go back and look at the back into the 40s and see if there was a forest there at that time. Uh, even up in the brushlands where we, get a lot of fires going through. You may not see the redwood or the, or the fir up there. It's because every 20, 30 years, it burns off and has a stand replacement fire. But what our policy and what the rules have us do is we go back on one of these, on some of these cases, and we'll see if we can find the old stumps, or we'll see if there's a, a 20s photo or a 48 photo to show that there were trees there at that time. It's still timberland. It's still capable of growing trees. It just hasn't happened in, in the recent past. Hope that helps your question. What about all these eucalyptus groves? They're not any on any of your. Eucalyptus was delisted <laughs> for, as a commercial species about six years ago for us. Take them out. So <laughs> we don't we don't regulate eucalyptus. So but if you have eucalyptus that's growing in the redwood forest. We're looking at the land. We're not looking at the zoning. We're looking at the land. And so if there's redwoods growing on it, then you need to talk to us about that. Um, is oak, if oak's been cut, is that regulated? <coughs> if you're selling it, it might, it might be. We'd have to determine where it came from. So, yeah, on, on the oaks, the state does uh, require that it has identified oak woodland as a sensitive habitat type, and the, the county is and does enforce violations of sensitive habitat ordinance. If you're looking to take out oak, not tan oak, but the Quercus species of oak, uh, you want to talk to the county first. Um, don't start taking out oak without speaking to us because, again, you don't want to end up in a uh, code enforcement situation. Keep in mind, just because you're cutting oak, uh, and you want to, if you say you want to get a grow that's in an old woodland that has some conifer trees growing up, and but all I'm going to do is cut the oak trees. I'm going to leave these redwoods over here. Then a determination needs to make, be made, is this whole thing timberland? Just because a redwood's growing there, like I mentioned earlier, doesn't mean you can't grow a redwood over here. It may have been prevented just because that oak is growing there for this 200 or 400 year period. Once that oak falls down, you may see ceilings coming up of the conifer species. That makes it timberland. What about the cutting of trees uh, in the relation to creating defensible space for permitted dwellings? Okay, so when we look at defensible space, we're not really advocating going out and cutting trees down. If it's a dead tree, yes. But we're really for defensible space, we advocate limiting the trees up. Uh, and not having the trees and encroach on the structure itself. So it's rare that, um, I've had a few cases where somebody's cleared 150, 150 feet around their structure, say, well, I'm doing my defensible space, and I cut all these redwood trees down as part of that, I don't need a permit, that didn't work. Uh, we rarely allow that. 
how do we rarely ask somebody to cut their trees down? We really want to actually have the shade to keep the temperatures and the moisture levels where it won't conduct fire. Any other questions? Um, if you have a source of, say, city water coming in, is that obviate the need to have the storm other water? Yes. I am. He's saying yes because he works for the provided county. The I don't regulate yeah, that. Provided so, the city water, mm -hmm. so the, the requirement is is a hydrant within so much so, so much distance from your structure. Um, so you definitely want to confirm with uh, the other fire folks. But my understanding is that on municipal water, typically the municipal water systems have enough water to meet, and you also have requirements for sprinklers and for indoor grows. So I, the, the, you won't require storage for if you're on municipal water. Any last questions before I wrap this up? Okay. Oh, one more. I'm considering a site in SoCal that has sand hill protected. Area. In sand hill? In SoCal? Can I do a 10 by 20 spot? So in. <laughs> First of all, I, well, I, um, I'm not sure if, you, if the sand hills, have, I don't know of any sand hills in SoCal. Most of the sand hills we have is the other side of Highway 17. There's a small patch off of Jarvis. Um, but in sand hills, if it requires soil disturbance, it, you're not going to be allowed to have a grow. Um, if you've got an established structure there that you can grow inside, that, that would be allowed. Um, there is potential in some of the, the quarries. Uh, that are closed, that have reclamation plans, that can be adjusted to do something in a quarry bottom where you don't have the, the, the habitat. Um, but other than that, sand hills, because you have the, the federally listed June beetle underground, any ground disturbance can take it. Um, we've made the decision, and I believe, I believe the board will support it, that you are not going to be allowed to do ground disturbance activities related to cannabis <coughs> cultivation in sand hills properties. Um, that will also go for ground disturbance in the areas around uh, salamander production ponds, salamander breeding ponds. Those are mostly in the Larkin Valley area to Bonita on the other side of the highway and down by Buena Vista. So that area, because that species is a fully protected species by the state, uh, they estimate underground. You'll never know when they're there. They're typically in oak woodland understory. Um, so in those oak woodlands, we're not going to be allowing clearing of that type of oak woodland for cannabis um, cultivation. Uh, Matt and Robin, a uh, real practical overview question here. At this time, just an approximation, how many permits are you getting uh, coming in, or uh, people coming to get permits? Well, for, like, you know, like the numbers of registration, uh, yeah. uh, 760, right. yeah, we have about 760 registrants that want to get a cultivation license. Right. 760. That's for cultivation, not manufacturing, but yeah. Okay, that's all. Do <laughs> so you have a guess of how many manufacturing people you're going to see? No idea. I mean, we have some ballpark, which was estimated in the environmental impact report, but just ballpark. Yeah. Are you going to do a registration phase, like the cultivation for the manufacturing? Is it just going to? Be it hasn't been decided yet. Okay. Yeah, that piece. But um, just to wrap up the uh, to wrap up this whole um, presentation, as you can see, there's there's some layers you're going to have to sort through to get your state license, and some things have feedback to the county because of you know as we talked about here, um, there are sensitive habitats that we look at, the state might not look at. But we are here, the Cannabis Licensing Office is here to help you through this process to the extent we can. The state, you know, we're not going to walk you through the state process, but, but we tried to facilitate this meeting to give you a, an idea of what's to come. Um, we will be putting on our website any useful updates or information that come from the regulatory agencies at the state level and their contact information so that you can, you know, easily get in touch with them and find out the latest. But I think you're, you see you need a team. You're probably going to need an engineer, you know, uh, to help you set up your site. If you have a site that's all established, you know, it all it, it really varies. But you know, if you're going to set up a new site or something along those lines, you're going to need an engineer. You're going to need a licensed forester, possibly a land use consultant to back you up to get you through this efficiently and as painlessly as possible. Because there's a lot to go through here. Um, and I just hope that uh, you can. You know, you can watch this back later to kind of refresh your memory about what was said. But if you have questions, 
we'll make sure you have their contact information. And going forward, the licensing office here, our doors are open, we're happy to help. We can talk about your property and its unique circumstances. And uh, we do plan on having more of these workshops going forward to kind of take the next steps and prepare you. So this is our goal, is to help cannabis come online here in the county and get you through this. So please, please keep in touch. And is there any, um, I guess, last question for the, any of the folks that came here tonight? Any burning question or are you guys ready to go? Ready to go. Okay, thank you so much. Have a good night.